Stems are an interesting adaptation, uh, particularly of vascular plants, that have allowed plants to move further away from water uh, and also to occupy really unique niches. Let's take a look uh, at the functions of a stem. Uh, the number one function of a stem that we'll be focusing on quite a bit throughout this week is the ability of stems to translocate or move the water and nutrients and sugar uh, through vascular tissue. Um, so the ability to basically take that water from the roots, uh, from those tiny root hairs using that xylem, and bring it up to um, the leaves throughout the plant, whether it's a, a tiny little uh, fern, which is a vascular plant, a vascular seedless plant, all the way up to the cone-bearing sequoias that are hundreds of feet high. And in doing so, it provides that valuable resource of water, which is used for a couple of different processes, but particularly photosynthesis, and then also takes the products of photosynthesis, uh, those glucose, those nutrients, to all the different cells throughout the entire plant so that they're able to undergo cellular respiration and provide energy for growth, reproduction, um, and other functions. Um, stems support the leaves and help uh, plants get those leaves up to an area where they can receive the most sunlight possible. And in some cases, they also help store food for the plant for later. Uh, if we take a look at uh, the, the tissue, the actual um, meristematic tissue, uh, remember we talked last week a little bit about meristems and how these are areas where growth is occurring. And we talked about how there's apical meristems at the very tips of the roots and the tips of the shoots. Um, and there's also lateral meristem, which is meristem uh, primarily uh, for the development of secondary growth. Um, but with the apical meristem here in the tip of a shoot of a plant, um, we have cell elongation, we have cell division and growth uh, primarily for primary growth. And plants want to do that and grow this uh, shoot tissue in order to support leaves, to get them into the sunlight, uh, to allow that plant to produce food for itself. Um, so here's just again a close-up of that apical meristem. Um, at the terminal bud, terminal end of the, uh, of the stem, and uh, we'll come back. There's a bunch of different kinds of stems, and we'll be talking about a lot of them this week. Uh, woody stems are stems that um, undergo secondary growth, so they actually can grow um, not just from the, the shoots and the roots, but also um, inside out um, and develop woody, uh, woody candy, uh, cork cambium or a woody stem, like uh, typically trees. Uh, grass stems, which are typically hollow, if you've ever bitten into a uh, uh, grass, and you notice there actually there's just kind of space in the center. Uh, herbaceous stems, which would be basically any, any annual or perennial that's got kind of a soft, instead of a woody, but a soft green stem. And then there's also modified stems, which um, are, are um, we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, when we talk about vascular tissue, remember we're talking primarily about the xylem, which transports water, and the phloem, which transports that food, that sugar, uh, that glucose. Um, if you were to look at this, let me get out of your way here. Go away. All right. Um, note that xylem tissue, uh, rather than being actual like tissue or phloem tissue, it's actually like spaces, uh, kind of hollow tubes that are created by these um, this tissue that grows around it. Um, basically, think of a straw. And so that xylem, um, which can look a little different depending on what kind of plant. Um, you're looking at might look if you think about like your own esophagus, for example, or a vein in your body. Um, these kind of allow things to travel through them, and these specialized cells um, that create kind of this, these pockets of spaces are arranged in certain ways in our bodies, and uh, they have different components, which we'll be talking about a little bit more when we, we talk about specific plants. Uh, and so we are going to be talking about this vascular tissue. Remember that um, vascular plants, uh, we sometimes call these our higher plants. They've evolved more recently, and they've evolved this vascular tissue to allow them to move away from water. So think about our, our non-vascular plants, like those in the division bryophyta, like our um, mosses, which need to, to move water um, through osmosis because they don't have these specialized um, conductive tissues that allow the, the water to move and, and, and the nutrients to move. Um, so again, with non-vascular plants, um, they would not have xylem and phloem. Um, they have to move, uh, move things along from cell to cell based on concentrations. Um, and typically because of that, they aren't very, they're, they're not large. They're usually very small, very short. If you think about mosses, they're near a water source often or very um, uh, small and flat and in, in locations that allow them to capture that, that water. Where our vascular plants, um, and again, this does include things that might not be seed plants like ferns, um, but uh, they have evolved these tissues to allow them to 
to live further away from water, to grow taller, to occupy different niches. Um, and so um, these specialized cells, uh, this vascular tissue allows them to, to do different things. Um, much like in the root, our vascular tissue is arranged in specific ways in the stem. And that, of course, varies from monocot to dicot. Remember when we talked about the dicot root, X marks the spot for the xylem, and then the phloem is kind of arranged around it. Whereas in a monocot root, uh, that vascular tissue is around, arranged in a ring around the edge. Now, when we look at stems, it looks a little bit different. Um, the dicot stem looks a lot like the monocot root in that all of that vascular tissue is arranged kind of in a ring around the outside. And we'll talk a little bit about um, the implications of that in a minute. Uh, whereas in a monocot stem, like here, you have that vascular tissue uh, throughout, um, just kind of scattered everywhere. And so if you think about like a corn plant, if you were to cut it, um, or if you've ever chewed on like sugar cane or something, you could look inside and you see um, all of that vascular tissue. Sometimes it's very stringy even. You can, um, you can sense that uh, arrangement. So the dicot root has the vascular tissue arranged with xylem in the middle and the stem is around the edges, whereas the monocot root has the vascular tissue in a ring, kind of like the dicot stem, <coughs> but in a stem the monocot tissue is arranged and pitted throughout. Here's kind of a, a better example of that. <coughs> so if we were to bite into it and look at the cross section, you would see kind of this, um, this complex tissue, the vascular tissue arranged throughout, uh, and this other, the parenchyma tissue, um, the other kind of um, more simple tissue arranged um, throughout the plant. And then in a dicot, we have it right around the edge. And the reason for that is because uh, we'll be talking a little bit about woody stems and secondary growth. Um, we, we have plants that kind of grow in girth from the center outward in terms of its stem. If you think about um, a tree getting bigger and wider over time, uh, that vascular tissue is actually kind of arranged in a ring around the outside. And uh, we'll be coming back to that arrangement and, and why that matters uh, a little bit later this week. Let's take a quick look, though, at, at the outsides of the stem. So the parts of the stem, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about nodes. And we actually use uh, the term node to... Um, uh, kind of loosely, but basically it's the swollen part of a stem uh, where buds grow. Uh, and so if you look at this branch here, uh, here's my node, and in between those spaces are the internodes. So if you think about like a branch of a tree, a branch of a um, plant. So if you think about this Dracinia, if you look, um, this Dracinia doesn't actually have a lot of nodes on its stem all the way growing up. Uh, but you can see that at one point it did, down here, the swollen part here, where uh, other tissue grew. And a node is not specialized, meaning uh, it can grow into a vegetative tissue or it can grow into a reproductive tissue. Let's, let's take a look here. Um, but, so buds form from nodes, where these little individual swollen parts of the stem are. And uh, a bud can be a terminal bud at the very end, the apical meristem of the plant. And they can also be lateral or auxiliary buds on the side uh, along the stem. And we actually identify these buds um, where, you know, they're forming from the nodes, the kind of swollen part of the stem, uh, based on what tissue kind of grows from them. So if you look, here's a good drawing. If I look at my branch here, uh, I've got, this is a, an apple tree. And I've got, um, we call them sometimes spurs or fruit spurs. From right here, uh, fruit is going to grow. Whereas I've got my new flower um, that might form from this bud here. So we call it a flower bud instead of a fruit bud or spur. And then here would be my leaf bud. And so we identify them based on what tissue grows from them. And depending on the plant, um, it can be um, you know, a variety of different patterns. Uh, but we also use that knowledge to kind of see where growth is happening. We can actually uh, look at new growth for a season versus old growth um, based on sort of the um, space between the nodes, for example. You might see um, smaller spaces between newer growth and longer spaces between um, or internodes between older growth. Um, and um, yeah, so you can also use it to help identify plants as well. Um, buds typically appear, and we call them um, apical buds or terminal buds based on where they are. So the tips of a stem, um, 
or auxiliary if it's kind of in between where um, let me show an example of auxiliary where it's kind of um, kind of in the armpits right of the uh, of the stem uh, or lateral buds we sometimes call that uh, or adventitious so for example um, when we talk about plant propagation and um, layering like air layering if a plant is wounded um, then buds can occur um, in, in a place where normally they wouldn't based on the pattern of the tree. Let me move this down. We also can identify a plant based on the arrangement of where their buds are. For example, if I was trying to identify a, um, a type of tree and I know that they had opposite bud arrangements, so the leaves were arranged opposite of each other along the stem uh, versus a plant that I'm looking at that might be alternately arranged, I can use that to help identify a plant um, when I'm looking at a dichotomous key, for example. Um, and so we can use um, everything we know about a plant to help identify it. Uh, if I've discovered a new species, for example, I would look up to see um, all these different characteristics and if it's one that's already been named or if it's something that no one's seen before based on all of these um, clues to its identification, such as um, bud or leaf arrangement. Uh, another thing that we want to discuss when we're talking about um, stems is this concept of apical dominance. So if you remember when we're talking about meristems, we're talking about how this apical meristem is the tip of the shoot. And so from this new growth will occur. And when you first have a brand new plant, in fact, your seedlings that you planted last week, um, if you're starting to see sprouts come up, uh, you're going to see a period of pretty steady growth where shoots tend to shoot up as quickly as they can. There's a hormone that we'll talk about later that helps kind of um, uh, instigate that, uh, and that's auxin. And the job of auxin, just like we've got uh, hormones in our own bodies that our glands make to help us get really tall all of a sudden uh, when we're hitting puberty, so too do plants have these hormonal responses uh, that allow them to grow appropriately. So apical dominance, if you think about this, is a strategy for plants to want to grow straight up instead of nice and bushy. Because if I grow straight up faster than my neighbor over here, then I'm going to actually get more sunlight and end up shading that. So it's, it's kind of a competitive advantage. And so apical dominance is a plant's natural capacity to want to grow straight up and be tall rather than bushy. Now genetics play into that, and some plants by nature might be more compact and bushy, but take a look again at my little Jacinia here. If you look at this, look at this really spindly growth. It's gotten super tall, uh, and in fact, it's gotten so tall it's kind of slumping over a little bit. Um, but if I didn't like that growth, if I wanted it to be nice and short and bushy like this one, then one thing I can do is actually snip this off right here because the hormone that produces this auxin that says, hey, grow tall as fast as you can, is right in that apical bud. So if I were to clip this or pinch it back, which I just did, then I'm going to start to see, instead of apical growth, I'm gonna to start to see some nodes form, those adventitious buds form here along my stem to encourage that lateral growth. Because by removing that auxin, that hormone, right? It's just like I blocked that production of hormone here. I'm allowing other hormones, in this case cytokinins, which produce those lateral growth and buds to grow. And that's why we pin you end up with nice bushy lateral growth because the meristems here are now triggered to grow as opposed to just these here at the top. Um, but we will be learning quite a bit about different modified stems such as bulbs, tubers, corms, stolons, and rhizomes this week. And also a little bit more uh, about the process of transpiration, which is really moving water and those valuable nutrients that they carry throughout the plant and also making sure that plants get the nutrients that they need throughout. More on that to come.